uh, CT scan and MRI. To start with, can you interpret this scan? This is about a 30 year old male who comes to the clinic with proptosis of one eye. I wouldn't say which eye. So looking at the scan, can you say which eye is proptotic and uh, what is the possible diagnosis? Is this an axial or a coronal scan? Coronal scan. Mid-coronal, posterior coronal, anterior coronal? Mid-coronal, okay. So what do you see? What abnormality do you see? Is the abnormality in the right eye or the left eye? Right eye. But what do you see? Is this abnormal or is this abnormal? You think right eye is abnormal, okay. So what is the abnormality? Absolutely. So what is the diagnosis? Ha, there you are caught. If it is keratico-cavernous fistula, what would you find inside the dilated superior ophthalmic vein? If it were to be fistula, would you find contrast inside? But there is no contrast inside as compared to the other eye. So what is it? Thrombosis? Cavernous sinus thrombosis. So it's as simple as that. Without looking at the patient, just looking at the coronal scan, one single scan, you are able to diagnose this condition, right? and which is a medical emergency. So CT scan and MRI can make life so simple if you know how to interpret. The role is to localize a lesion and know the extent if you are planning surgery and also to find the effect on adjacent structures such as this optic nerve has been displaced nasally by this dermoid that is here and looking at the Hounsfield values you can actually say that it is a dermoid already without even doing histopathology. You know tissue composition by knowing the Hounsfield value of the intra-tissue Hounsfield value and also plan surgical management. The principle of X-ray is this. There is a cathode tube or an X-ray tube which sends in through the tissue that is the body in question. And there are some parts of the body like bone which will not obstruct or which will partially obstruct X-rays and soft tissues will not obstruct X-rays and that will be generated as a film and that is generated on a photographic film which will be developed. So it is actually a negative image that you see. The parts that obstruct X-rays will be seen as white, whereas parts, parts that lets the X-rays through are seen as black. But then it is all superimposed. It's like, grossly speaking, truck running over something. You know, everything is flattened. So there are bones which are superimposed over each other. The contrast level is so low that you cannot easily identify structures using an X-ray. Whereas in CT scan, the principle is totally different. In CT scan, what happens is that the, there is a gantry which runs along on either side of the patient, all around the patient, and thin collimated beams are sent through the tissues, and they are caught individually. So the resolution is very good, and it is like taking histopathological sections through the body. So slices can be varied depending on the need. The indications for CT scan and MRI are this, unexplained proptosis, ptosis, or ophthalmoplegia. These are common indications followed by a palpable orbital mass where you want to know the posterior extent of the lesion. Any patient with orbital cellulitis or preceptal cellulitis with early orbital sign is also an indication. Orbital trauma with proptosis as you see here or even with inophthalmus because you want to know if there is an orbital fracture and unexplained afferent dysfunction of the pupil. Otherwise, the uncommon indications are any anterior segment tumor such as ocular surface squamous neoplasia or even an eyelid tumor with orbital extension, intraocular tumor where a child with retinoblastoma or an adult with melanoma presenting with subtle proptosis or signs of orbital inflammation, orbital signs in paranasal sinus disease. Now this child has very subtle proptosis in the left eye, he has retinoblastoma. You must do a CT scan in such patients or an MRI in such patients to know if there is any extraocular extension and you can see that the optic nerve is involved right up to the orbital apex. If you were to miss this subtle proptosis and don't do imaging before enucleation, you would probably be cutting the optic nerve somewhere there, leaving residual tumor behind. So that is the importance of imaging in a patient with intraocular tumor. When you ask for a CT scan, you don't order a CT scan, you request because the ego of the radiologist has to be satisfied. You look at certain parameters. You can't simply write a prescription saying that I want CT scan of the orbit. That is not good enough because the technician will do exactly what he thinks is right for the patient. But you should ask or request what is right for the patient by including these parameters. Slice thickness. The available range is 1 to 10 millimeter. So if you, for orbit, if somebody does a 5 millimeter scan, 
then that is suboptimal because between each slice there might be a tumor which is four and a half millimeter wide, right? So you're going to miss vital information if you ask for a wide slice thickness. Orbit, what is considered good is two millimeters slice thickness. And for optic nerve pathology, one millimeter slice thickness is good. In older generation CT scans, the problem was with the radiation exposure because lower was the slice thickness, longer did it take for the imaging. But with spiral CT scan, the acquisition is the same irrespective of what slice thickness you want. It is all reconstruction. So you can ask for thinner sections, even 0.5 millimeter or 1 millimeter for optic nerve pathologies. Generally for orbit, 2 millimeter is what is done. Now you also need to look at whether you want to ask for a contrast CT scan or a plain CT scan. In orbit, if you suspect a pathology which is vascular, you would ask for a contrast CT scan at the upfront itself. Otherwise, you can't send a patient for CT scan. He comes back with a plain CT and then send again for a contrast. That is really not done. Like this patient who where you suspected a vascular lesion, obviously you look for enhancement. So you do what is called pre-contrast Hounsfield value and post-contrast Hounsfield value in such a CT scan and the radiologist has to give you both these values because otherwise you can't determine how, is, how much is the contrast enhancement. Contrast enhancement can, can be mild, moderate or severe depending on the enhancement in Hounsfield value pre and post-contrast. Anything which is less than 30% is considered mild, 30 to 60% is moderate and more than 60% is called high contrast enhancement. Next is imaging plane. There are two principal imaging planes in CT scan. One is axial and the other one is coronal. Axial is always parallel to the Reed's line. And what is Reed's line? What is Reed's line? This is Reed's line. What is it? This is orbitomiatal line. It runs along the inferior orbital wall to the external auditory meatus. It's a line which is assumed line or it is a surface landmark. Anything that is parallel to it is called an axial scan. Anything that is not perpendicular to it, not exactly perpendicular to it, but at an angle of about 75 degree is called coronal scan. It is not perpendicular, exactly perpendicular because you will get a lot of teeth artifacts if you were to run very perpendicular. So coronal scans are not perpendicular to the axial scan slices. They are at about 75 degree angle to the Reed's line. The one more important aspect when you ask for a CT scan is to ask for soft tissue window, window and bone window. You can see that this is of the same patient done with the same setting except for the window width and window level. I will come to these technical aspects a little later but this in essence is a soft tissue window where the tumor is seen in different hues of grey, correct? Whereas if you were to do a bone window, you can see the internal architecture of the bone but the tumor is all hazed out. You cannot differentiate the eyeball wall from the tumor at all. Everything is hazed out. That is a bone window. If you were to ask for bone window in a routine CT scan, you are going to miss a lot of tumors and their boundaries. So you must ask for both bone window as well as soft tissue window. Bone window will give you internal architecture of the bone, whereas soft tissue window will tell you exactly what is the internal composition of the tumor and its relation to extraocular muscles and the normal orbital structures. This again to differentiate soft tissue window from bone window. Also to let you know that bone window can be done at different settings. This is a very, very lopsided setting where the margin of window width and window level are very high. I will come to that later as I said. But this has been set at a modest level so that you can see both soft tissue as well as bone. So you can play around with the settings of a CT scan machine to get you the optimal resolution. This is the where this is the aspect where discussion comes in. You can tell the radiologist as to exactly what you are looking for and they will be able to deliver it to you. If you are suspecting a patient who has orbital viruses for example, then if a patient is lying on the CT scan gantry in a supine position, the viruses is going to disappear. Then it will get a negative scan. You will get a negative scan. So you must instruct the patient to do a Valsalva manoeuvre when you are doing a CT scan in a patient who has orbital viruses. And if you want to visualize the anterior visual pathway entirely, the optic nerve entirely, then you must mention specifically so because optic nerve when the patient is lying supine is little curved. It's not as straight as you want. So the angulation has to be specific. It has to be about 45 degree angle. 
And in um, patients with bilateral retinoblastoma trauma, suspected pericellar tumors and neurocysticercosis, etc., you want bilateral brain CT as well. And you also ask for 3D reconstruction. 3D reconstruction can be of various types. You can have soft tissues. Each of the soft tissues can be progressively removed to show you the entire bone as a 3D reconstructed image. This is very useful for patients who are undergoing orbital reconstruction. In, in fact, patients who are undergoing orbital decompression as well or patients who are, undergone, are undergoing massive orbital fracture repair, this is important. You can overlay now 3D reconstructed soft tissue images over bone images for particular specific details if you are planning a very specific reconstruction. This is how a 3D reconstruction of a patient who has undergone trauma helps. You can know exactly what is happening to the zygoma. You know exact volume of the uh, replacement implant that is needed. For now, Nowadays you can even contour this implant. You can get this implant manufactured by sending images of CT scan axial and coronal to a company which makes the uh, implant of the size that is needed by the patient. It, it can be that customized using 3D reconstruction. One quiz question for you. What exactly is this? This is a 3D, re pardon? Yeah, this is the no abnormal eye. This is an anophthalmic eye with an orbital implant very well centered in the orbit. And this is the normal orbit. So this is the bone, obviously, you're not showing any soft tissue and the implant shows up. What all information does a CT plate contain? It contains the patient data. You must identify the patient before you start interpreting. CT scans and have got exchanged in the radiologist's office. So when a patient comes with a surprising CT scan which you're not expecting, or in any case for that matter, you must identify the patient first. You also must look at whether the scan is plain or contrast. Look at axial scans, coronal scans, and then technical parameters. Patient data is generally on the top left side. Patient's name is mentioned, age and gender, and the date of birth are all mentioned. And on the top right, if the radiologist is uh, very particular, he mentions the window width, window level, and the slice thickness as well. These details you expect from the radiologist. Plane or contrast is generally mentioned in the CT scan, either denoted by a single letter P and a single letter C, or they might actually mention plane CT and contrast CT if they are very particular. And also the Hounsfield units, each within the tissue, are necessarily mentioned. Laterality can be reversed in older generation CT scan. You can see that the tumor is actually on the right side here, and this is the reversal. So reversal can happen in coronal in older generation CT scan. This is how you get the CT scan film. If you have a view box in front of you, and if you just push, put the CT scan film in the view box, this is exactly what you see. What is this first film called, first picture called? It is called the scout film. Scout film has these parallel lines. This set of parallel lines are actually the areas where these slices have come from. So if your tumor is, suppose this is the, or, sorry, suppose this, this is the orbit, mm. suppose this is the orbit and the tumor is somewhere there, so big, and the scout film uh, parallel rays are not running along the tumor, but some part of the tumor is extending beyond the scout film, then the imaging is not complete, it is incomplete. So you must look at the scout film and then see if that is covering the parallel lines that are covering the entire tumor or the area that you intend to image. Beyond that, it is all the axial scans that are arranged from, from downwards to upwards or upwards to downwards. It is always arranged from conventionally from downwards to upwards, right? That is why you see the nose so prominent here, so much of air that is in the sinus. And as you go higher, you see less of air and more of brain, unless it is somebody who has air in the brain. Now, what all does the normal lower axial scan contain? What are the structures that the arrows are pointing to? What about this? Nasolacrimal duct. Suppose somebody has a nasolacrimal duct obstruction, it will be seen as a white haze or a gray haze within the nasolacrimal duct. If somebody has a tumor, that will be shown as destruction of the bone along the nasolacrimal duct as well. What about this? Yeah, orbital soft tissue, maybe the lower pole of the eye and some inferior rectus as well. What about this? Okay, what about this? Inferior orbital fissure leading on to pterygopalatine fossa. Right, so it's very easy, it's not difficult at all.
Now look at the normal mid-axial scan. This is exactly how you interpret. This is sphenoid sinus. And what about this? Optic canal. And what about this? Lateral to optic canal is superior orbital fissure. So as simple as that. And you also see the extraocular muscles, the lateral rectus, the medial rectus, trochlea comes into view. And of course the optic nerve is seen very nicely. And the eyeball as such. And then you see further details of the trochlea and the superior oblique and the structure that runs like this is superior ophthalmic vein and this is sometimes it can be seen as an intraconal lesion enlarged superior rectus can be visualized that way this is superior rectus LPS complex and what about this lacrimal gland right so depending on what are you looking at you can identify all the normal structures if you look at the coronal scans, it's exactly the same. These parallel lines in the scout film indicate exactly the area that has been imaged. And the coronal scans are always arranged from anterior to posterior. So you first look at the nose for that matter, a lot of air here. And the nose comes into view and finally the orbit. If you look at the normal anterior coronal scan, what are the structures that you look at? This is ethmoidal sinus maxillary sinus, lacrimal gland, lateral rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus, superior rectus and this is superior ophthalmic way. Very good. And what about posterior coronal scan? Inferior orbital fissure and you see all the recti, all the recti separately and you can see the terminal portion of the superior ophthalmic vein. And you must look at this coronal scan through the orbital apex for very vital details. If you find one of these structures enlarged, then what does it mean? Optic canal is enlarged. That means that there is an optic nerve pathology, a chronic optic nerve pathology such as optic nerve sheath meningioma. What about this? Superior orbital fissure. And this is sphenoid sinus and this is maxillary sinus and this arrow leads to inferior orbital fissure. So in the coronal scan through the orbital apex, you see both the superior orbital fissure, inferior orbital fissure and the optic canal. Right? So it is a very important view if you are looking at something which is at the orbital apex or a neurotrophic tumor. Looking at the technical parameters, we have these technical parameters to interpret in a CT scan. This is the most important slide in my presentation, Hounsfield number. Hounsfield number is something which will help you identify the tissue in question. Looking at just the Hounsfield number you can actually say without the pathologist seeing the tissue that you are possibly dealing with this particular tumor. Because air is minus 1000 Hounsfield value, fat is minus 100, water is 0. But beyond that soft tissue is in the range of 30 to 40, blood is in the range of 70 to 80, calcium more than 100, metal more than 300 and bone you can say plus 1000. So air is minus 1000, bone is plus 1000. Everything else lies in between. Soft tissue ranges from 30 to 40. You can actually discriminate blood within a lymphangioma by looking at the Hounsfield value. Lympho lymphangioma can bleed forming chocolate cyst and that can be determined by looking at the Hounsfield value. Now tof soft tissue window and bone window, this is the concept. In soft tissue window, the window level is fixed. This is a simple way of explaining window level. If window width is a spectrum, window level is the midpoint of the spectrum. If the window level is fixed at 50 and the window width is 100, that means that you are imaging everything in the range of 0 to 100 Hounsfield units. Anything less than 0 in the CT scan will appear pitch black. Anything more than 100 will appear absolute white. Everything else will appear in various shades of grey. You got it? This is a concept that you must understand. Window level is the midpoint of the spectrum of window width. And this window level and window width are nothing but connotations of the Hounsfield units. Right? You heard about Hounsfield values in the previous slide. And if you want to discriminate one tissue from the other, then your window width has to be reasonable, incorporating all the Hounsfield values that you see in the eye. So generally for soft tissue windows, when you want to look at tumors, Window level is fixed at 50 and window width is fixed at 100. That means you image everything from 0 to 100. Anything less than 0 
including air will appear pitch black anything more than 100 including bone will appear absolute white right but if you want internal architecture of the bone visible like this then you fix the window level at 400 and window width will be 800 what does it mean if the window level is 400 the least you are visualizing is 0 and the highest you are visualizing is 800 so you have a more discrimination power in terms of the internal architecture of the bone whereas the soft tissues will all be grayed out so bone window and soft tissue windows are something that you must mention in the ct scan requisition form otherwise they are not going to do it all these information are given in the film but these are to be ignored then how to read a ct scan systemically systematically you have to have a view box which can accommodate two or three films like this you have to have a divider because you can easily measure tissues with this and superimpose on a scale as you are doing here. Otherwise, some of the radiologists even give measurements. You should always start looking at the bony orbit and then go to the eyeball, then extraocular muscle, extraconal tissue, intraconal tissue and cella and precellar uh, area. Now, when you look at the bony orbit, you should see if there is any contouring of the bony orbit. You can see that this particular dermoid has resulted in excavation of the bone in contrast to the contralateral side. Again, this particular tumor has resulted in excavation of the bone. A nice smooth excavation indicates that you are dealing with a benign tumor or a long drawn process. Whereas if it is erosion of the bone, that means that you are dealing with an inflammation, infection or a malignant process, more likely a malignant process. If you are dealing with hyperostosis, that means that you are possibly dealing with a meningioma. So based on the bone contour, you can establish a lot of stuff. You also look at the orbital walls, like in patients who have had fractures, you can see the destruction of the contour of the orbital wall. The medial wall is destroyed here, there is a medial fracture. Floor is destroyed here with resultant soft tissue incarceration into the maxillary sinus, a floor fracture. Look at the paranasal sinuses, specifically in patients who have orbital cellulitis, like this patient who has a subperiosteal abscess has contiguous paranasal sinus infection as well. So the patient will need an ENT consultation. So similarly, you look at the ocular coats in a patient where you are looking at the eye, like ocular coats. For example, this is calcified, but beyond the calcification, is there anything happening in the ocular coat itself? Is the sclera thickened? Is there any extra scleral extension in retinoblastoma? Or in this patient with melanoma, has the tumor come out of the eye? Is it in the orbit now? These are the details that you must look out for, and also foreign bodies. In extraocular muscles, shape is very important. Like this patient has uniformly enlarged extraocular muscle, indicating that most likely it is thyroid orbitopathy. This belly is enlarged, but there is a cyst inside, indicating that it is cysticercosis. This is all moth eaten appearance of the extraocular muscle, indicating that it is what is this pathology? Bilateral preceptal orbital lesion with moth eaten appearance of the extraocular muscle xanthogranuloma of the orbit, very classic pathology. And also look for insertion, involvement of the insertion of the extraocular muscle. In extraconal tissue, you look at the lids. If the lids are thickened, as you see here, or if the lacrimal gland is enlarged, you will know in extraocular tissues, extraconal tissue. In intraconal tissue, you look at the optic nerve and the superior ophthalmic vein. And as I was mentioning earlier, if you want the entire optic nerve image, conventionally only optic nerve gets imaged in one plane. See, you can miss segments of the optic nerve, but if you ask for optic nerve imaging, then they do a different kind of a cut. When the patient sli is slightly looking up, they take a 35 or 40 degree angulation to the reeds line, and then you get the entire optic nerve in one go. You also look at the angle. This is called coning of the optic nerve, coning of the uh, posterior part of the eyeball or angle, where in thyroid orbitopathy, if you are expecting stretch optic neuropathy, then you me must measure this angle. Generally, it is about 150 degree and anything less than 90 degree is supposed to be an indicator or a high risk factor for stretch optic neuropathy. Without any compression effect, the patient does not have any compression here at all, but the patient is losing vision rapidly because there is tremendous increase in the intraorbital volume because of fat expansion and there is coning, 90 degree coning, because of which the patient may have stretch optic neuropathy and may lose vision. This is, of course, you know already, superior ophthalmic vein. Cella and pre-cellar paracella region, if you are a neuro-ophthalmologist or looking at lesions in the brain, you must look at cavernous sinus carefully and also in the pituitary area. In MRI, I have very little time left. In MRI, I will just deal with the anatomy of MRI. 
in uh, MRI you must discriminate between T1 and T2 and fat suppressed versus fat not suppressed. In T1 all you must remember is vitreous is always black and the fat is absolutely white and the optic nerve is greyish. If vitreous is white and fat is little greyish and optic nerve is little dark grey then that is T2. And in T1 you can suppress fat. Fat is very very bright white. Now if you are looking at an intraconal tumour which is somewhere there and that is also bright white, how will you discriminate between the fat and the intraconal tumour? By suppressing fat. The tumour doesn't get suppressed. So this is artifactual. You are only suppressing fat here. So intraconal space becomes very evident if you have a T1 fat suppressed image. In T2 also you can suppress fat and look at the intraconal structures very carefully. Just to give an art artificial example, this patient has a tumour here for example. This patient has a white tumour there and if you suppress fat, the tumour becomes very evident. Similarly, a tumour which is I have created, it is not there, is there. When you suppress fat, then only it becomes evident. Here, it is not evident at all. It merges with the rest of the background. And you can have similar images for coronal and sagittal as well. So you must remember that T1 always gives you anatomical details and T2 gives pathological details. So if you look at this table and remember it, at least try to remember it, for various pathologies there is different T1 and T2 architecture. Inflammation, infarction, edema and most of the tumours are hypo on T1 and hyper on T2. In fact, almost everything is hypo on T1 and hyper on T2 except melanoma, hematoma and calcification. Melanoma and hematoma are hyper on T1 and hypo on T2 whereas calcification is hypo on both T1 and T2. Very simple way of remembering but in between these there are a lot of features that the radiologist will elicit and let you know in an MRI scan. That all that is very confusing for a postgraduate student. PG students must remember what is T1 and T2, what is fat suppressed image or stir sequence and what is hypo on T1 and hyper on T2 and what is reverse, what is both hypo on T1 and T2 and what is hyper on T1 and hypo on T2. Interpretation in clinical context, there are various lesions that can be interpreted such as orbital varix, varix when the patient does Valsalva, carotid cavernous fistula in patient who has uh, say um, etiology of this sort with trauma presenting with severe proptosis, vascular tumours such as uh, capillary hemangioma of infancy which contrast enhances, a cavernous hemangioma or a phlebolith in a patient who has lymphangioma, patient with orbital mass of various etiologies can be looked at on CT scan with great detail. Optic nerve pathologies where there is intralesional calcification indicates that it is optic nerve sheath meningioma or thickening of the optic nerve itself, non-uniform thickening. Solitary plasma cytoma with uh, uh, lesion based in the spinoid wing with expansion into the intracranial cavity, orbit as well as the temporal fossa. Secondary tumours from the paranasal sinuses etc. Orbital metastasis again centred in the spinoid wing. Inflammatory disorders such as preceptal abscess. In NSOID and um, TED, the point of difference is the involvement of the insertion. Like this, medial rectus is also enlarged, but then the insertion is also involved. Whereas you find in TED that it is a spindle shaped enlargement of the extraocular muscle, and the insertion generally is not involved. Whereas in uh, patient with cystisarcosis, there will be a dilatation of the muscle along with a cyst inside. Trauma we have already dealt with. I think I can skip all that. Yeah, just to show you structural abnormalities, like a patient with neurofibroma comes to you and you find this nice gaping hole in 3D reconstruction, that means that the spinoid wing is missing and the patient may have actually have a meningoencephalocele. In uh, neuroophthalmology, looking at the MRI scans, you can actually interpret optic atrophy because you can see that on the contralateral side, the nerve is thin and also optic neuritis, you can see that the optic nerve is grossly thickened here and this is how you differentiate optic neuritis from optic atrophy and in patients who have uh, obese individuals with headache, etc., if you have uh, CSF backflow or dilatation of the proximal portion of the uh, meninges around the optic nerve that is benign uh, intracranial hypertension, optic nerve glioma, etc. And of course, empty cellar syndrome and pituitary, etc. So, uh, to conclude, I would say that uh, 
Primary indications for CT, of course, we know are trauma, suspected uh, foreign body, orbital tumors, bony lesions, calcific lesions, and intraocular tumors, except bilateral heritable retinoblastoma, where you would do MRI. Primary indications for MRI are principally optic nerve lesions and neuroophthalmological indications. MRI is better than CT because it does not give irradiation, better soft tissue resolution, and no beam hardening artifacts. It is also better for neural lesions and brain lesions. MRI is inferior to CT because there are motion artifacts, poor spatial resolution, there are other artifacts called chemical shift artifacts, bone details are not seen at all or seen with lot of haze, calcific details are often missed and traumatic lesions especially if you are suspecting the foreign body MRI is contraindicated. Role of PET CT because it gives both morphologic and metabolic information. It is useful in patients where you are suspecting a metastatic lesion or a primary lesion. So that's where I end. Thank you so much.